this question. Why do people get so upset over spoilers? And what I mean by that is, why do people get so upset if you ruin the end of a book or a movie or a TV show for somebody? Why is it that if I go around and I start saying, oh, you know, I really like this show that you like, oh, it really, it really was awful when this person died. Why is it that somebody will get upset about that? Well, I think many of you probably, like me, is probably because we enjoy following stories. And when we enjoy those stories, we don't like it when those things are kind of revealed to us prematurely. It kind of feels like it's ruined it a little bit. It's been, uh, as is here, uh, spoiled. The reason I want to talk about this in the beginning is just because today we are going to be spending our time thinking about a word. Think about a theme in Paul's teaching ministry, not only in Ephesians, but throughout other letters too. And that theme is mystery. And so the title of today's sermon is Living the Mystery of the Gospel. If you guys will turn to Ephesians 1, you'll see that in chapter 1, verse 9, Paul mentions the mystery, and he'll talk about it again at the end of the book in chapter 6. But this isn't the only place that Paul talks about the mystery of Christ. He talks about it in Colossians, he mentions it in uh, Thessalonians as well, I believe. But today, we'll notice that although this mystery is revealed and we'll be talking about it, he emphasizes something a little bit different for us this morning. And so, let's begin with a word of prayer as we begin to hear the word and contemplate what it means to live the mystery of the gospel. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for gathering us from wherever we've been, from our weeks, from our tiredness from whatever it is that you are bringing us to you bring us here so you can speak to us so we can hear your word so that we can uh, be rejuvenated and so lord in this time we pray that as pastor chris prayed that as we hear your word it would bring life to us we thank you for your presence and we pray this in jesus name amen as we begin our passage we are going to be just looking at the first sentence of this chat um, of ephesians 3 verse 1 to 3 and as we look at it, I just want to uh, begin by noting, like, it kind of feels like a word salad, doesn't it? He says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles, uh, assuming that you have heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by the revelation as I've written briefly, uh, it kind of feels like Paul's jumping around, doesn't he? You know, if we look at it, he says, for this reason, I, Paul, on behalf of you Gentiles, what? What does he do? What does he say? He's like, oh yeah, by the way, have you heard of this? And, and what I suspect is going on here is actually in light of what Paul was talking about in chapter 2, uh, that is the unity that we have in Jesus, he was going to offer up a word of prayer and praise. And we actually get this picked up on in verse 14. Because Paul begins again, and he says, For this reason, I bow my knees and I pray. And so what do we have here? We have kind of like an impromptu interruption in what Paul is saying. Because as Paul is about to launch into prayer, he says, I am a prisoner of Christ on behalf of you Gentiles. And then he thinks, that's a loaded statement. I probably should unpack that a little bit. And so he says, assuming that, you know, you've heard about what's going on with me, assuming you've heard the God, uh, of God's grace that's been given to me. And then he also says, well, that's kind of complicated too, right? Let's unpack that a bit. And he says, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I've written briefly. And I just want to appreciate here a little bit that it's one of these sentences that kind of just gets more complicated the longer you read it. Um, and we might be kind of like, oh man, what, what's going on? And so I actually want to use this sentence as a guide for our time this morning because Paul begins by talking about his circumstance. He's in prison. Then he talks about his calling, kind of why he's in prison. And then lastly, he talks about the mystery, the why he's called. And so he kind of has three whys. And that's sort of how we're going to walk through this passage because Paul kind of has an upside down sandwich structure about this where after this, he explains the mystery, then he'll backtrack to his calling, and then he'll bookend it with an encouragement about his circumstance. And so, as we begin, I want us to just begin, oh yeah, there, um, by talking about and thinking about the mystery. 
right? Because Paul is saying, he, this is the reason. This is kind of the heart or the meat of the sandwich. And he says, the mystery is why he's in all this hot water. And so how can we understand mystery here? Um, there are three things I want to take away from his explanation in these verses. The first thing is that this mystery is supposed to be understood. Right? He says, you can perceive my insight into this. So it's not like far off. Secondly, it's something that was hidden away from all time before. And thirdly, it's something that was only made known possible by the Spirit. And I wanted to kind of give us those three things because when we think about the word mystery today, there are kind of three different ways that I think we think about mystery. The first is kind of like a Sherlock Holmes murder mystery, right? Where we kind of are, have all the pieces, we have the dead body, we have the bloody knife, you know, we have all the pieces around and we're like, okay, if you're clever enough, you can put it all together. Right? If, you, if you were smart enough, you could walk into this room and you can tell the whole story of what happened. And sometimes we think of mystery like that, where all the pieces are there, but if you're smart enough, you'll have everything. The other way I think we tend to use mystery in English is to describe something that is just unknowable. Right? Where did my sock go after in the dryer? Why do I only have one left? It's a mystery. You know? uh, what am I going to go eat for lunch after this? It's a mystery. Like, there's just some things that we are not meant to know and that we'll never know. And, you know, that's how we use the term mystery. But the third way that we use mystery, and this is the way that I'll explain it, is kind of inspired me from uh, the story of The Hobbit. And so in The Hobbit, there's this scene where um, Bilbo is going around, he's lost in a cave, and he encounters Gollum the slimy, creepy, kind of bony figure guy. And uh, Bilbo's terrified, but he needs a way out. And Gollum knows the way out. And Gollum is weird and hungry. And so he says, you know, I want to eat you. And they bargain and they say, well, how about we choose the option of whoever uh, kind of solves the most riddles? And so we're thinking mysteries as the Sherlock Holmes thing, right? And so what happens, they go back and forth with riddles, back and forth. You know, they'll say things like, uh, oh, 30 white horses on a red hill, and then Gollum will go, oh, it's teeth, right? And they'll go back and forth, back and forth, and it's really cool to read, it's really fun to read, but near the end, Bilbo is exasperated. He can't think of any more riddles, and as he's looking for just something to inspire him, he's patting his pockets, and he says, what's in my pocket? And Gollum screams, he freaks out, he says, that's not fair, and he says, how am I supposed to know what's in your pocket? And Bilbo, kind of tricky, kind of follows along with that. He knows it's not a riddle, but he kind of goes, oh yeah, that, that'll be my riddle for him, right? He says, what's in my pocket? Solve that. And it's kind of weird, because it's like, when I read that too, I was like, that's not fair. That's not a riddle. You know, I, I can understandably solve those other things, but when it comes to what's in his pocket, how on earth am I supposed to know? That's not fair, you know? The only way that Bilbo, or the only way that Gollum would possibly know what is in Bilbo's pocket is if he told him and then showed him. As if he told him and showed him. And this is how I think Paul wants us to understand mystery in this passage. It is a secret. It is something that has been guarded, and yet it is now being told and showed. You see, um, in the context of the people Paul was writing to, uh, the Ephesians probably would have been very familiar with this word because there were many people in antiquity or in ancient Greece who kind of fancied them about mysteries. And not, not that they went around sharing riddles with each other, but rather that there were these groups of cults that would be about mystery, where there, would, uh, where there were these diverse groups of Greek groups where only, uh, you could only enter by special initiation. In other words, the, with this secret knowledge, it was a secret ritual, you were given exclusive access and special privilege. Knowing this secret would mean that you were invited in this group, that you were welcome in this group, and you were better than everybody who was outside of this group. Right? And so, this morning, Paul is kind of using that idea to try to get interest in uh, kind of what he's doing. But as I hope to show us we see that Paul kind of takes that idea of mystery and flips it on its head. 
And so, what is the mystery? Uh, very plainly, in verse 6, Paul says, The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In other words, the mystery is that Gentiles, people like you and me, people who are uh, latecomers to knowing God, people who are outsiders, people who didn't follow the law as well as the Jews, people who didn't know the law as well as Jews, these people, despite all the reasons that they might have felt bad about themselves or felt disqualified, were readily accepted into God's family. And you'll remember, as we've been looking at Ephesians 2 and 1, that this theme of unity is one that Paul has just been harping on again and again. And although it is not explicit in this passage, it is described here. Each of these benefits in verse 6 begins in, in Greek with the prefix sin, kind of where we get the word synergy. It means togetherness. And what he's trying to point out here is that these two groups, although they're so different, are joined together in Jesus. There's equal standing between these two groups because of what Jesus has done and because we are placed in him through faith. What I think is funny about this, and kind of as we pause to think about unity a bit as a mystery, is the subheading of this passage. If you're reading in the English Standard Version, this uh, subheading says something like, uh, the mystery of the gospel revealed. But I'm curious, do any of you have a new international version with the subheading? Well, if you don't, it's here. And it says, it's God's marvelous plan for the Gentiles. And I think this is really awesome because it really shows, yeah, these latecomers are welcome. This is the idea that, that God wants to welcome uh, those who are outsiders. But it's funny to me because if it's marvelous for the Gentiles, why isn't it marvelous for the Jews too? Why is it only marvelous news for the Gentiles? You know, it's not an easy thing, unity, because it's very human for us to perceive grace as not fair, because it isn't. There should be some benefit or status for those who have been following God longer, who have been following God better, who have been more strict in their discipline or in the ways that they have understood God, their theology, you know, maybe more cleverly. But this mystery proclaims, it brags in the face of that and says, Gentiles are equal, despite bringing nothing to the table. And this reminds me of the parable that Jesus tells about the workers, where in the morning, uh, a manager goes and he calls out workers at the beginning of the day, and he says, I'll pay you this much money if you work for me. And then midday, he goes out again, and he hires people, and he says, if you work for me for the rest of the day, I will give you this much money. And right before the end of the day, he goes out and he says, if you work for me, I will give you this amount of money. And the amount of money between each of these groups, we would think, is different. But it's the same. And as he's handing out these gifts to these people, or the, the wages to these people, the people who work the longest are frustrated, right? Why is it that these people who work so much less than me have what I have? See, unity sometimes can be frustrating for that reason. We all feel like we're a little bit entitled to something. And yet, and yet, God's grace goes further. You see, Paul continues, and he not only moves on from this idea of mystery, he kind of expands and he says, okay, so that's the mystery. Here is why I'm so obsessed with it. Right? He says, this is why, this is my job. And he continues this train of thought, and he begins to list his qualifications as a minister or a steward for the mystery of the gospel. And what I think is fascinating here is, what is it? He doesn't say that, you know, I'm qualified to share the gospel because I've been trained. He doesn't say, I've been taught by the best of the best. He doesn't say, I hung out in Jerusalem with Peter and James and John. He doesn't say, I was in the wilderness and, you know, I, I did all these things. What is the grounds for his service? It's grace. It's grace. He says, it's this gift that's been given to me. Why? Because God wanted to. And it's funny because he could have probably pinned 
any number of things. You know, Paul was a very successful and, and very uh, smart person, and yet he says, I'm not going to hang any of my laurels on that. God called me just because God wanted to. It's grace. And he probably remembers that he at one time persecuted Jesus and his followers, and yet he had the privilege to know and serve God more. But one thing, though, is why do we make such a big fuss about grace? If you've been reading Ephesians, you'll know that Paul had taken a great effort to talk about grace. Ephesians 2 talks a lot about grace. Even in chapter 1, we were talking about grace. Why is grace so important? Well, it's because grace is a great equalizer. There are two things that I think all of us have in common. Or uh, there are probably many things we all have in common. But there are two ways that we can kind of view each other. One thing that we all have in common is that we are all sinners. We all sin. We all fall short of God's standard. We all have given into that selfish desire. We've all hurt someone or been hurt. We're all in this situation where we are stuck and helpless and, you know, more than often than not, at fault. And it's funny because despite the fact that all of us have been at fault at one point or another, that's not really a rallying cry for us to treat each other very well. Because what happens is if we treat and view one another as people who have just sinned, we don't really treat each other much better. We instead focus on the hurt that other people have done. We start getting competitive and comparative about how little we have done or how much we have done. And it's funny because despite all that, if we just keep focusing on sin, the type of people we begin, is more, uh, we begin to become is just more sinful. And that brings us to the other grounds by which we have common ground, grace. That we have all received abundant riches from God, not because of anything we've done, but because of who he is, because he loves us, because he accepts us. And the thing is, if we start viewing each other not by sin, but by grace, what happens? When we start seeing other people in light of the grace we have received, we're more likely to offer grace ourselves. We begin to be more patient with our neighbors, with our spouses, with our brothers and sisters, because we realize we need patience. We begin to uh, extend love without expecting anything in return. We begin to see things a lot differently. We actually start growing into the type of people that Paul talked about in Ephesians 2 verse 10. The type of people who are ready to walk in the good works that God has prepared ahead of time. Why grace? Because it gives us common ground. Paul could have, you know, again, he could have said anything. But he decided to focus on grace. That which is equal in the Jew and in the Gentile, in Paul in us. And so, um, and the other thing I want to just mention is what's fascinating here is that um, though Paul uh, is just also how Paul uses the word here, uh, because when he's talking about his motivation to serve, he could have used any other words, right? He could have said, you know, I, I'm a minister according to the gift of God's grace. He could have said, I'm a minister because someone needs to do the job. He could have said, I'm a minister because I know it and you don't. Right? He could have said there's a need here. He could have said there's a responsibility there. There's a duty here. And although those things are all true, he decides to focus on grace. And I think also if we are going to be people who are proclaiming this mystery, we also need to be focused on grace. And so uh, verses 8 to 10 kind of focus on uh, not why Paul is there, but what Paul is there to do. And he highlights two things. He's there to preach to the Gentiles. He's there to tell this secret to people. But he also mentions something that is not quite mentioned anywhere else. Um, it's kind of newer. And he says, So that, in the green, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might uh, now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. It's interesting because unity is not an end in and of itself. Paul is not proclaiming the good news so that people will get together and get along and be happy. He's saying even that has a purpose behind it. And that purpose is that God planned for all of creation to see what he is doing in Jesus and in those who live and follow Jesus. And what's interesting is that this God who created all things 
You know, this life that we are living in church isn't just for ourselves. It's not just so that we feel good about unity. It's not just so that the non-Christians will see us and, you know, they'll want a part of this too. It's not just for, for all those things. In fact, Paul says the angels are watching. The heavenly forces are watching. All of creation stops and stares when they see this people who are led and live by grace, who get along not because they have things in common, but because they have one thing in common. And I just want to mention here, uh, that last sentence there, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, that's a, weird, that's a weird thing, right? It's a weird title. We'll talk more about that later in the book because this is actually a phrase that Paul brings back at the end, uh, chapter 6, when he talks, talks about spiritual warfare. Um, but I want to appreciate what Paul is doing here. Paul is working as a counter to mystery. Ironically, even though this was hidden for ages before, he's saying it has to be shared right now. Don't stop. Right? It's the opposite of kind of like an inside joke. Right? I don't know if you guys have ever been in a situation where there's inside joking, but you know, if you're in a room and there's just like a bunch of people who have known each other forever, sometimes they'll mention something that you just weren't there for. Right? They'll laugh about it. They'll say like, oh yeah, I remember this. Or maybe they'll just make a reference. They'll say like, oh yeah, that bagel was toasted. And then they'll all break out in laughter. And you're kind of sitting there like, what's, what's up with toasting bagels? Like, why are you so excited about it? It's because there's something there. There's that secret that they have that you don't. And if you've been in that situation, you'll know that in those times, secrets divide. It separates the inside and the outside. It says you implicitly aren't welcome because you don't know this. But how does Paul use mystery here? How does Paul explain this secret? It's the opposite. It's the reverse of an inside joke. You see, uh, in that time, for them, mystery was such a dividing thing. They probably would have heard mystery and they thought, oh yeah, the insiders and the outsiders, those who know and those who don't know. And yet, Paul is saying, the mystery of the gospel actually doesn't divide. It unites. It begs people to come in. It invites them to know the God of the universe. It says, do you have sin? Do you have burdens? Do you have brokenness? Jesus can take care of that for you. You are welcome. The last part here that he talks about is kind of another thing. He says, this is according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. And as I was reading this, I struggled because I was like, this seems so out of left field. He was just talking about mystery, and now he's talking about Jesus, whom we have access... Until I remembered that mystery, again, is about bringing people in. The Ephesians would have thought of mystery as that thing that granted them access, that granted them privilege, that granted them boldness because they knew it. Paul here is reminding us that our unity is not determined based on our cleverness. It is based on how rooted we are in Jesus. See, sometimes we are given a task like be united. And we are quick to try to fulfill it in any way we want. You know, we'll say we need to be united. So, you know, we'll gather people based on what they have in common. We'll divide ourselves up by race, by ethnicity, by gender, by age, by interest. And we'll try to achieve a unity or play at unity in any way we can. But Paul here is reminding that true unity, the kind that God wants, the kind that God planned, the kind that God is inviting us to, is not based on those things. It is based only upon what Jesus has done for us. And then he finally goes back to, I'm in prison, guys. You know, he's, he kind of refers, you know, after all that mystery talk, he's like, yeah, by the way, I'm still in prison. But he says, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. And so, as we kind of look at this, we see that his circumstance bookends this whole talk on mystery. So why did he go on this like, little rant about it? I think one is because he doesn't want his listeners to worry. He's trying to explain his circumstance. He's in prison. These people obviously care for him. He wants them to know he's okay. But more than that, that he is there because he is being obedient to God. He's willing to take that sacrifice. He's willing to suffer for Jesus. But the other thing 
is that he wants to show them that unity, this value he's preaching and proclaiming to them, is not something that is just realized in thought or in speech or in you know, nice letters. It's something that is realized in life, through living. He's willing to show them that I'm suffering for your benefit. You see, uh, community living is difficult. I kind of refer to that when I, even just talking about the Jews and the Gentiles and their differences. And you know what's funny is despite all the differences and fights that the Jews and Gentiles had at that time, even before the Gentiles came in, if you read the first four chapters of Acts, the Jews were still fighting. They're still fighting each other. Conflict is so wired in us. And yet Paul is saying, look, this is not just something that we think about. It's not just something that we sing about. This is something that we live. He says, I'm glad to be imprisoned if it means that people are learning the secret. If it means people are coming into a new humanity of being in Jesus. And so, as we close off, the one question I promised that I would try to answer, I never really got to, and here it is. Um, what does it mean to live the mystery of the gospel? We talked a lot about mystery. We talked a lot about unity. We talked a lot about grace. What does it mean? And my simple answer is this. It means to live in response to God's grace. In the modern age, we sometimes lose mystery because when we know something, we treat it as solved. You know, the first time you play tic-tac-toe, it's really fun. The hundredth time, less fun because you kind of know you're going to lose in like the second turn. We've mastered it because we know it. And that, I think, is a trap of our age. Yet, Paul knew this mystery well, but it was not something he mastered. It was not something just to be known, it was something to be lived in the church. And I hope you can appreciate that uh, despite explaining the mystery, despite talking about it, we haven't really ruined it like a spoiler. Moreover, despite talking about it, despite thinking about it, despite you know, singing about it, dreaming about it. We are no closer, no closer to realizing it unless we live it out. You know, we can paint murals all over about how we're, you know, so united, but if no one shows up, it tells a whole other story, doesn't it? Unless we take seriously what God has done by placing us in Christ, we will only play at the kind of community that God wants us to be. Our common ground is not race. Our common ground is not culture. It's not age. It's not gender. It's not wealth. It is the grace of God. Sometimes we may feel tempted to try to master the gospel or master the mystery, to direct God where to go or how to go, but the mystery reminds us to be humble. It reminds us that apart from God's grace, we would still be lost. Yet, it is God's gracious desire to be found, to be known and loved. And this is what Paul staked his life for, and what we also can be living for. Not only because of a sense of duty or responsibility, but because of God's grace received. How do we live in mystery? We don't try to master it. We don't try to find it out. We don't try to solve it we instead let it master us. We don't try to take grace and manipulate it. We just receive it and let it master us. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's saying, you know what? I've received so much. Let what God wants to be done be done in my life. Let's close off with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you have invited us to the mystery. And this isn't just like a murder mystery or anything like that. Uh, you've invited us to be part of your family, and this is good news. And it is only by your grace. Lord, help us not to lose sight of that. It's so easy to be hung up on so many things, on the hurt of other people, on the sin of other people, on the difference we have between one another. And yet, your solution is simple. It's this mystery that you chose to invite us, that you want us even though there's so much in us that is, feels wrong. Lord, we pray that your spirit would unite us, that we'd be able to live uh, 
the mystery of the gospel. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.